Welcome. Is that working? Welcome, everyone. Can you hear? Welcome today, Ninamani. I acknowledge this land that we meet on today are the traditional lands for Ghana people and that I respect their spiritual relationship to their country. I also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are as still as important to the living Ghana people today. My name is Nick Brown and I'm the Collections Manager at the Flinders University Art Museum. Firstly, some housekeeping. In the event of uh, a fire or other emergency, the automatic alarms will sound and we'll um, calmly evacuate through the emergency exits, um, namely this one down the bottom, um, and we'll just go down the stairs, follow the path and head towards the car park. If you need to go to the toilet at any time, the uh, toilet's directly behind the lecture theatre outside the corridor here. Um, so today's talk will conclude at 11.45 and will actually um, be followed by a student screening which will commence at about 11.50. And I just want to say that um, everyone who, anyone who's not a Flinders student is most welcome to stay for this screening of a multi-award winning documentary, Once My Mother, and that screening will conclude at about 1 o'clock. So feel welcome to stay, but I also understand if you need to go straight after the talk. Um, this, this screening, just to give you a bit of background, investigates why Adelaide film director Sofia Turkowitz's Polish mother abandoned her and uncovers the truth behind her mother's wartime escape from a Siberian gulag. So, welcome to Flinders University and today's event, Mother Tree, Lydia Groblitska, as part of International Museum Day and the South Australian History Festival. The official day for International Museum Day is actually tomorrow. However, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia and is a worldwide celebration of sexual and gender diversities. I'm wearing my miniature rainbow dots today um, and Flinders University have raised the rainbow flags on their poles, on their flag poles, and Tonsley just down the road will be lit in rainbow colours in celebration of this important day. So if you're in the area this evening, um, the Tonsley building will put on a great psychedelic show. Um, so today's event is acknowledging International Museum Day, which has been celebrated annually since 1977. The day boasts around 30,000 museums participating from over 120 countries, and we are really proud to be a part of this international event, with this year's theme being Museums and Contested Histories, saying the unspeakable. Combined with South Australia's History Festival, a discussion on the late Polish-Australian artist Lydia Groblitska, who resided in Adelaide for some 45 years, is fitting. At the Art Museum, uh, we are also very interested in using art as a cross-disciplinary tool for teaching and research. Some of you may be familiar with our 50th anniversary publication that we produced last year, titled Speak to Me, Conversations with the Flinders University Art Collections. And this project engaged 50 Flinders staff and students across 20 schools and departments, from archaeology to medicine, biological sciences, to the creative arts and school of history, to respond to works from the collection. So for the Speak to Me project, Mother Tree, a woodcut made in 1972 by Lydia Groblitska was selected by today's guest speaker, Dr Catherine Kevin, who is senior lecturer in the University's School of History and International Relations. Um, she was drawn to the work Mother Tree in connection to her recent research with Dr Karen Agata on the plight of mothers from the displaced person camps of post-World War II in Europe um, who migrated to Australia in the 1950s. So the, um, 
So it's going to be a bit of an art, historical, social history talk today, a bit of a combo with, um, and the structure will be the following. So I'll talk about the late um, Lydia Grublitzka's life and practice in connection to the two works that we have on display. I'll also have them on PowerPoint just for ease of viewing as I talk about them. And I'll talk about these works in connection to her life and her practice. And then I'll introduce Kath, who will use Mother Tree as a starting point to elaborate on her recent research. I'll begin my talk today with a recollection of a 1988 photograph depicting the late Lydia Grabitska working in her studio. To me, the photograph encapsulates nuanced details pertaining to her printmaking process and technique, the content and conceptual nature of her work, whilst it also speaks to me of her personal history and inner sensibilities. We don't have this photograph in the museum collection, it's in a private collection, so let me describe it to you. And I'd ask that you retain this visual image in your mind throughout the talk. Lydia Grablitska sits on timber floorboards, barefoot and cross-legged, warmed by the sun that filters through the window of her economically furnished home studio, which is nestled at the base of the Adelaide Hills, where the artist resided for 45 years. Behind her is a chair adorned with a repetitive lion folk print. Grabitska holds a small carving tool and makes decisive incisions and gouges along the grain of a block of wood, which eventually becomes one of many images of home and a sense of place, or of loneliness and displacement, or of life and death, or human connection to the natural world. If we pay attention to one of the signifiers in this photograph, the carving tool, for instance, that Lydia holds. We embark upon a journey of the artist's life through the Great Depression, World War II, her studies in fine art, and her migration to London, then Adelaide, and the parallel unfolding of her artistic influences and practice. This small carving tool is one of a handful from a toolbox that has travelled with Grabliska over a great distance. It was obtained in her homeland, Poland, during her studies at Krakow Academy of Fine Arts between 1951 and 57. Krakow, however, was not Groblitska's birthplace. Born in Szulkiew, Poland in 1933, during the frugality and hardship of the Great Depression, Groblitska then grew up in Szerminex, where her parents taught at the highly regarded Szerminex Litzum, an educational institution in which her botanist father was Professor of Natural History and who first inspired in Groblitska an enduring love for the natural world. In September 1939, as we know, World War II commenced with the invasion of Poland by Germany and then the Soviet Union, which, annexed, which resulted in the division and annexation of the country. By 44, Grobitska's family, acutely aware of the disappearance of neighbours and locals in the community, fled to Norvi Sonj of southern Poland. And this provided the family with comparative sanctuary to continue with their lives. Krakow, near Norvi Sonj, is one of the major Polish towns of the dramatic Carpathian Mountains, the second biggest mountain range next to the Alps. It was against this beautiful sublime backdrop and alongside the aftermath of the atrocities of war that Grablitska, that Grablitska gained great technical skill in drawing and printmaking. As we can see these two works contain a naive quality about them so we must always remember that this is an intentional style for Grabitska as her early works reveal a talent for realism. She was trained as a realist at the academy. Grabitska also studied Polish folk art at the Academy under the tutelage of Roman Reifus, one of the leading Polish ethnographers of the time, and this proved to be a significant influence of the, on the development of Grabitska's later work, including these two prints. So the small carving tool 
then travelled with Grablitska to London in 1958, and here she married, gave birth to a child, and felt strongly the inner turbulence and unease of migrating to a foreign place, particularly the confined urban environment of London, which conflicted with her familiarity and love of the forests and mountains that surrounded her in her various homes in Poland. Grablitska moved with her husband, child, and carving tools in 1965 to Australia, settling briefly in Sydney before moving to Adelaide in 1966. Her feelings of alienation and rootlessness were compounded by this additional relocation to Adelaide, as well as Adelaide's suburban sprawl with its, and its dry, hot summers. This fractured sense of self, of identity and of belonging for Grablitska was somewhat appeased by her art making and her relationship with the natural world. Grabitska's 1972 tree series, which includes these two woodcuts, made in Adelaide, is an example of this sort of cathartic output and demonstrates her enduring longing for home. Carved with her precious Polish tools and possibly on her favourite pear tree wood, brought to Ad also brought to Adelaide from abroad, the woodcut sun tree evokes a vision of a, of a child's tree house with its childlike yet sophisticated rendering. In this symmetrically balanced print, composed with one-dimensional linear patterning, Grablitska nestles a miniature home made up of a house, a tree, a fence, uh, like a nest into a thickly trunked tree with protective branches displaying fur-like leaves. In this idyllic home scene, the sun shines larger than life, with one stray ray of light morphing into maybe a leaf or a bird's feather. But is this a happy picture? The composition is spare and flat, and yet in some ways, the more I look at it, it contains a deep emptiness, emphasised by the hard-edged black and white boundaries and a complete absence of colour and tonal variety. At either side of the dominant tree is a cat and bird, animals of the domestic sphere and of the forests, respectively. The animals are also Grablitska's dear companions. They're her friends during her experiences of isolation in Adelaide. The cat's tail appears to transform into a tree root, tunnelling into the earth substrate, whilst the bird's tail, like the sun's appendage, is both the shape of a feather or a leaf. Here, animal, tree, earth and human life are connected. Are the animals and trees protectors of the home? Are they benevolent forest fairies of Polish folklore in disguise? Is this the part imagined, part remembered connection to place that Groblitska constantly seeks? Warmed by the sun, sheltered by the tree, loved by the animals and grounded by roots held in the earth. Now, if we zoom in tight to this image, maybe through the window of the house and crop it in tightly, um, there is a natural transition into mother tree. Maybe mother tree is an interior version of sun tree or a reversed image of sun tree, mimicking the image reversal of the printmaking process itself. In mother tree, we see a young woman with a penetrating gaze holding a crying baby. She stands atop a tree trunk as if an extension of the tree itself, which surrounds her with its reaching branches, nurturing the woman in turn as she nurtures the child. This image might symbolise rebirth, a new beginning or a new home, or maybe it conjures up the image of the Virgin Mary, who in Polish mythology was known to reside in the sacred linden tree, for this dark silhouette of a tree is not that of the eucalypt, which surrounded Grablitska in her home in the Adelaide foothills. Grablitska's unity and ge geometrization of forms, her use of rhythm, repetition, symmetry, as well as her symbolic treatment of human, plant and animal figures, reveals the influence of Polish folk art, where a similar methodology is applied to crafts such as paper cutouts, decorated eggs, tapestries and religious woodblock prints. It is in this realm of Polish folk art 
that Grublitska finds further solace and connection to her homeland. Now take your minds back to that photograph that I described earlier and visualise it again in your mind. <coughs> After Grublitska carves her image, maybe it's mother tree, she then rolls on black ink and lays a delicate, almost translucent sheet of bone-coloured Japanese paper on top. And using a section of pig rib bone, she rubs the back of the paper, transferring ink to paper to reveal the final image, which is an unapologetic statement of emotional fragility and the strong roots that guide us back home. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Catherine Kevin to carry on from this point and speak about her response to Mother Tree in connection to her own research. Catherine Kevin is a senior lecturer at Flinders University, which she joined in 2007 after holding positions at SBS Television and the Menzies Centre of Australian Studies, King's College, University of London. Her research has been focused on the histories of pregnancy and miscarriage, feminism and reproductive politics and post-colonial perspectives on Australian film. Catherine is currently exploring, exploring the lives of women who migrated to Australia from the displaced persons camp, camps of post-World War II Europe, and she is working on a book titled Relocating Jeddah in Nunawal Country to be published next year. <coughs> Cathy is a co-editor of the journal History Australia and is on the National Editorial Board of the Australian Dictionary of Biography. Please give Kath a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, what a privilege to be paired with Nick as a speaker. That was really so fabulous. Um, so it was when Nick was planning this project, the Speak To Me project, that I was introduced to this beautiful, powerful work of Lydia Groblitska. Nick asked me to respond to the work in terms of my own interests and um, I could see meaningful connections very easily. Dr Karen Agata from the University of Adelaide and I have been working through Department of Immigration files from the 1940s and 50s that pertain to mothers and children who came to Australia as refugees. Most recently we have been looking at the social worker reports on unsupported mothers. This term, unsupported mothers, was a, used as a kind of catch-all and sometimes interchangeably with widow to describe mothers who had been widowed, whose husbands were li listed ad, as missing, whose marriages had ended en route to Australia or soon after arrival, or those mothers who had never been married. Lydia Groblitska migrated to Adelaide from her native Poland via London, as we've just heard, with her husband, Tedek. She was not an unsupported mother, but she was a mother. In the two decades before her own migration, 60,000 of Groblitska's countrymen, women and children came as displaced people from Poland via the refugee camps of Europe and elsewhere to Australia. Among them were unsupported mothers whose lives we are tracing in the archives. What struck me about this image, Mother Tree, was the mix of precarity and rootedness that it conveys. There was so much that was precarious in the lives of the unsupported mothers that we write about, not least recognition and respect for their relationships with their children. And yet, while they endured the precarity of displacement and poverty and pressure to be separated from their children, many of them were able to find ways to remain together as families, some through luck and some through dogged persistence. These women are virtually absent from the large body of historical writing on post-World War II migration to Australia, and they have never featured in the celebratory accounts of the emergence of the multicultural nation. The shame, stigma and struggle that attended the lives of single mothers and their children in mainstream Australia and led to silences within families and in national story, stories also weighed on the lives of displaced, unsupported mothers. These mothers have arguably been further burdened and further silenced, burdened by the conditions of their migration, including, and specific to these mothers, the two-year work contract they were obliged to fulfil. They also wore their marginal status 
as single mothers in addition to their marginalisation as culturally and linguistically other, as they attempted to see their way into, into a new life with their children. These women have not featured in the recent national apologies to those caught up in the history of coercive adoption, and their place in the making of national heritage has only recently begun to be forged. So today I want to begin by first giving you some context for the lives of these unsupported mothers. Then I'll talk a bit about the particular challenges that they faced within the migration system. And finally, I want to talk to you about a place called Benella, where many of the women we are studying were sent, and the recent project to bring the stories of this place into official memory. In July 1947, Australia signed an agreement with the International Refugees Organisation to settle European refugees or displaced persons. We often refer to them as DPs. Over the six years that followed, more than 170,000 DPs were brought to Australia as the government looked to actively grow both its population and its economy. And of course, this was just a prelude to an even larger migration scheme, um, which brought supported um, migrants to Australia in subsequent decades. The arrival of thousands of non-English speaking refugees was a challenge to a nation committed to the Im Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, colloquially known as the White Australia Policy. Key to Australia's reception of these DPs was the government's imposition of a work contract, whereby all single refugees and heads of families and unsupported mothers with the heads of their families would be required to accept allocated work for a period of two years. This effectively resulted in a system of indentured labour. Almost no consideration was given to previous experience or training, and significant pressure, the threat of deportation, was placed on workers to take up the employment allocated to them by the department. Generally, men became labourers, often in remote locations on infrastructure and rebuilding projects, and women were sent to fill live-in domestic service positions in private homes or institutions. A central plank of the Department of Immigration's strategy for convincing wider Australia to accept DPs was the policy of assimilation. In this period of social conservatism and economic boom, assimilation rhetoric functioned as a reassuring mirror for the host population, promoting the dream of prosperous family life as the ultimate aspiration of ref refugees and migrants. According to this rhetoric, new Australians, who were both good and willing workers and prospective breeders, were sought to fulfil the country's post-war aspirations. Department of Immigration officials initially sought young, healthy workers, giving priority to single people and childless couples. However, as the number of available suitable single DPs fell, selection policy was quickly extended to include family groups. From February 1949, families headed by single mothers were also included in the immigration intake. The motives behind the decision to, um, to do this continue to be debated, but it's clear that strict controls were imposed on the selection of candidates. A 1949 IRO report states, providing the babies are of European ethnic origin and the pre-selection of mothers is made with the greatest care since it is of the utmost importance importance that the best possible type of woman may have this opportunity. Although the children of these women were presumably future workers and breeders, the women themselves were situated awkwardly in relation to both categories of desired new Australians. Their parenting responsibilities meant that they were less than ideal workers and their status as prospective breeders was deeply compromised within dominant gendered moral discourses by their single status. You can see in these photographs published by the Department of Immigration that the idea of family life was central to the promotion of Australia's immigration program, both to the host population and to prospective immigrants. The first stop for most DPs was a government reception and training centre, like the one at Maribyrnong in Melbourne, shown here. These centres were part of a vast and complex temporary accommodation system established by the Department of Immigration to house DPs and other immigrants on arrival in Australia. Their aim was threefold, to provide short-term accommodation for new arrivals, to begin the process of assimilation through lessons in English language and Australian culture, and to make the workplace allocations of male breadwinners and single women as required by their work contracts. Much of the research Karen Agata and I have been doing on this project has been focused on the files of these um, places. 
They are central to our stories of what happened to unsupported mothers. In particular, the holding centres that subsequently were set up so that women and children had somewhere to stay while their menfolk went to work. And that's where many of the um, unsupported mothers ended up as well. It was within these institutions, the holding centres, that unsupported mothers came under the scrutiny of the Departments of Immigration and Labor. A number of things worked against them. When it came to finding work for these women, employers expressed a strong preference for those who spoke English and had only one child and one child of school age. Many unsupported mothers didn't fit this criteria. This undated telegram from one Department of Labor employment officer to another states that he is holding 43 vacancies for widows with one child, but there were no people to fill these vacancies as all the widows left have more than one child. As well as seeking to have these women fulfill their work contracts, there was a severe housing shortage in wider Australia and the payment of um, minimum wages for unskilled work meant that there was limited capacity for DP men to pay their families way out of the accommodation system and secure private housing. Women and children were waiting, therefore, in holding centres for much longer than anyone had anticipated. The steady inflow of refugees and migrants meant that government accommodation centres were pretty soon at maximum capacity. It's within this environment that unsupported mothers became the focus of the Department of Immigration's attention. It's worth noting that the Australian government charged rent for all individuals aged over three. This accrued over time if it wasn't paid. By the end of 1950, one widow at the Woodside Centre here in Adelaide, with five children under 16 years, owed £230, a considerable sum for the time. By 1956, some of these debts increased beyond comprehension as an unmarried mother with three children and a deserted wife of four children owed 377 and 615 pounds respectively. Social worker reports, while often understanding of the difficulties these women faced, were also quite derogatory, labelling them troublemakers and bad influences, describing them as of low in intelligence and poor physique, as the hardcore problems of the system. They posed both social and economic problems for the centres. And off-site employment was the only real long-term solution as far as the relevant de government departments were concerned. This would enable them to fulfil their work contract, move towards independence and out of the social settings of the hostel, relieving the authorities of a social and economic burden. As one migration officer suggested, without work, and I quote, their continued idleness might ruin what slight incentive may remain to accept some responsibility for their own and their children's long-term welfare. But what to do with the children while their mothers worked? Social worker and other reports from all states indicate the significant numbers of children who were placed in the care of government or charitable institutions across Australia as unsupported mothers either sought employment or were encouraged to do so to meet the requirements of their work contracts. In May 1950, the director of the Northern Holding Centre in WA declared that the industrial absorptive capacity of these women remains nil, and therefore a system of child placement must be promoted. For some children, this was to be a permanent arrangement. For many others, it lasted a matter of months or years. In the state of Victoria, 49 migrant children were placed under the Children's Welfare Act between April and October 1951, and monthly reports from social workers in other states show a steady stream of children being placed in a variety of care institutions, including Salvation Army homes, foundling hospitals and religious institutions where their mothers were often required to pay maintenance contributions of between 20 and 40 shillings per week, further kind of compounding the problem of the rent debts at the accommodation centres that would slow down the process of being able to get their children out of these places and establish an independent life. A June 1951 report assessing the situation of widows at Bonagilla Centre stated that there were 65 children dependent on 40 mothers who were proving impossible to place in employment. The report goes on to say that in some cases, all of a woman's, woman's children had been institutionalised, leaving the mother free to seek employment. In other cases, one child, usually the elder, was placed while the younger remained with the mother who sought employment that would accept them both. The report concedes the negative effect this would have on the family, especially the child who was institutionalised, 
and notes that for those families where more than one child was placed in care, the anguish was often exacerbated by large age gaps between the children that meant that they were accommodated separately. This placement narrative was the impetus, as Nick mentioned, for Sofia Turkovitz's 2013 film, Once My Mother. This film works through the sense of betrayal that Turkovitz had felt when her Polish refugee mother, Helen, placed her in the Goodwood Catholic Orphanage for two years when she was seven years old. It tells a story of her mother's survival in the face of almost unthinkable, unthinkable adversity. Before arriving in Australia as a single mother of a very young child, Helen Turkowitz had travelled alone and at times on foot from Poland to a Siberian gulag, then to Uzbekistan, to Persia, to Lusaka in Africa, and finally to Australia. In the film, Helen says, I don't want another country. That's my first and the last. Ultimately, she accepted that establishing her financial independence here required painful decisions. She says, I couldn't find a job when Sophia was small. They didn't like it in a hotel or somewhere if you bring children. Like many other women, Helen was forced to temporarily relinquish Sophia, an experience that left its mark on both mother and child. We venture in our research that Turkowitz's film illuminates a larger untold history of the experiences of single mothers and their children displaced by war and migration. Ooh, sorry. The women who faced these difficult decisions were scattered across Australia, mainly in the government's 23 holding centres. For some, another solution evolved. A holding centre opened on the outskirts of the central Victorian town, Benalla, in 1950. It had the advantage of nearby factories, particularly the Latouf and Khalil textiles factory, which was happy to employ migrant women. By October 1951, the factory was employing 300 women from Benalla, including 77 unsupported mothers. Archival documents indicate the rapid uptake of transfers of unsupported mothers from other centres to Benalla. The perceived suitability of this work solution is evidenced by the pressure placed on the officer in charge of preschool services to make an exception so that the children of factory workers could spend longer days at the centre kindergarten. For women like Mrs S, a Polish widow with three children aged three to nine, the transfer from Wakehall Centre in Queensland to Benalla is descri described as the opportunity of a fresh start. However, despite initial enthusiasm, in the longer term, the use of Benalla as a centre for unsupported mothers and their children became problematic for the Department of Immigration. Many remained there for very long periods of time, trapped by poor wages, and possibly exhaustion and a lack of desire into total reliance on the system. Indeed, one woman and her children arrived at Benalla in 1950 and were still there on the eve of its closure in 1967. While it operated, Benalla was labelled a sad and tragic camp where widows and single mothers were sent. Alex Delios has documented the long-term stigmatising impact of the discourses informing this description on the women and children who lived there. This contributed both to their isolation from the local community, many of whom now have no memory of Benalla as a place for single mothers and their children, and the reluctance of women to understand their experiences as relevant to heritage making processes. For many women, sorry, for many years, no one bothered to collect Benalla's objects of memory or the stories of women who were coming to the end of their lives. The significance of the site was much more likely to be attributed to the Air Force training that, that had occurred there during the war. As a place that housed the most vulnerable among the refugees who came to Australia in this period, it does not easily fit within the Three Cheers version of Australian history. And until recently, those who lived there have been silent about this past. I say until recently because a local woman, a woman called Sabine Smythe, a child of German immigrants, has led a campaign to have Benalla recognised as a Victorian heritage site. Part of this project involved commissioning migration historian Bruce Penney to write a history of the centre. The original application to the State Heritage Office was rejected. This has all happened in the last 18 months or so. So the original application by Smythe was rejected, um, but Smythe and Penne were not prepared to give up without a fight. 
they appealed the decision of the Heritage Office, um, which was then reviewed in the light of testimony given by the children, mainly daughters of mothers who had lived at Benalla. And the former camp is now on the state, state's heritage list. The testimonies that compelled the Heritage Office to make this decision late last year described the camp as a place of safety and camaraderie. There were many aunties, one um, person said. One man described his unsupported mother as factory fodder, but acknowledged that while there was work in the factories, the children at Benella were safe from the threat of being placed in an orphanage. Penne suggests that the success of the appeal signals increasing interest in commemorating the lives of communities rather than just significant individuals. The growing significance of grassroots campaigns for heritage listing and more flexible contemporary understandings of family. And yet the actual formal wording of the significance of Benella on the heritage listing stops short of singling out the unsupported mothers and their children as the distinguishing feature of its history, suggesting a limit to the hospitality of official national memory. The struggle to carve out, I'll just show you an image of um, Benella now, or last year. But the struggle to carve out discursive space for these stories of single refugee mothers, alongside celebratory scripts focused on the economic and cultural contributions of migrants, raises interesting questions about selective commemoration and its consequences for a genuinely more inclusive Australia that might provide a less precarious mother tree to vulnerable new arrivals. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kath, for that such um, such an insightful talk. Um, I was wondering if anyone had any questions for myself or Kath. Just pop your hand up really high, <coughs> and we have a roving mic. We'll have a roving mic going around. <coughs> while um, while you're thinking of a great question, there's Jackie. Um, I actually have a question for Kath. I hope it's not too much of a big question, so feel free to answer it in any way that okay. you like. You mentioned at the start of your talk official memory, and I was just wondering if you could kind of briefly describe personal memory, collective memory, and official memory, and how they all connect or don't connect <laughs> in, a, or in a really small nutshell. I should go to one of my students in the memory topic at this point. <laughs> <laughs> they need to know that. Um, in a nutshell, that's very difficult. Yeah, okay, well obviously um, personal memories, um, individual memories are informed by community memories. So I think, you know, we talk about uh, memories being very much kind of inflected and shaped by um, broader kind of national official and community memories, but also of course containing distinct elements. Um, and community memories, I suppose it depends on, you know, as, uh, we talk about memory as forming community, as having sort of um, collective memories that give mm. people a sense of belonging mm. to a wider group. And again, these are informed, of course, by individual memories um, of those who belong to the group, but also mm -hmm. of kind of more kind of meta-narrative histories um, and official mm -hmm. memories. Um, and then when we talk about official memories, I suppose, you know, a classic example in the Australian context in relation to my talk is, um, was the national apology to the stolen generations and the apology to victims of forced adoption, mm -hmm. which kind of has meant that those memories that have been um, definitely silent in the kind of national discourse, um, perhaps less silent within families, but silenced in some cases, um, and silenced within kind of wider communities as well, have now been brought into memory so that they are part of our national sense of what it means to be Australian. They've been given a kind of official status which has to transform then what our national kind of memory and therefore mm. our, our sense of national identity can mean and can look like. Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Kath. Brilliant. I think we had a question from Jackie. Thanks. Uh, 
Thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, my mum actually came here as a, well, she was 16 when she arrived, but she had to sign a two-year contract, even though she would have been a minor. Um, so that's interesting. It is, um, yeah. And she was separated from family who came with her, which weren't her direct family. So for, she had to travel separately, which was, I don't know why, but I guess that limited um, view of family at the time <coughs> affected that. Um, but my question really is about how you came to this topic. Oh, thanks, Jackie. Um, well, actually, a million years ago when I was an honours student, I um, had spent some time in Italy. I'd grown up with lots of friends who were from Italian families. I was really interested in Italian migration. And so when I came to write my honours thesis, I did a whole lot of histories with um, women and their daughters uh, so women who had migrated to, to Australia from Italy and their daughters. And I was particularly interested in the way that their practice of religion changed with migration and also the impact of migration on ideas about, about sexuality and, and femininity and gender and um, how they negotiated those issues within their mother-daughter relationship, <coughs> which now I think of it is kind of pretty relevant to, I mean, there are lots of things I didn't have time to say today, but I think one of the things that um, Alex Delios in particular has become interested in is the role of intergenerational storytelling, particularly mm. among women, for getting these stories on the public record or for making them part of a kind of wider sense of our migration heritage. Um, so I started with that and then I did some work for the New South Wales Heritage Office around sites of memory like Benalla and mm. then I didn't think about it for a long time and then um, Karen asked me to, Karen's been working on this stuff for a long time and she knows an extraordinary amount about the hostels, but she wanted to write about women and um, the, the medical care of infants and pregnant women. And I've done a lot of work on the medicalisation of pregnancy and infant care. And so she mm. sort of brought me in for that reason, but I did have this sort of existing interest in migration. Thanks, Jackie. Great. This is maybe a little bit broader than your field of study, Kath, sorry. But I'm just interested in the fact that after the Second World War there were immigrants who went to many different countries and the way Australia te treated people, is that different to, say, other Commonwealth countries or other countries? Because I'm looking at the way Australia treats yeah. immigrants now yeah. and mm. I'm thinking about those differences, whether there were differences then between Commonwealth and other countries or whether it was just Australia that treated people like this. That's a good question. Um, one of the, I mean, one of the distinct things about Australia that's really relevant to our project is this very complex accommodation system. Um, I think in the UK they had a, a sort of a much smaller and, and um, less enduring uh, similar system and something like that in Canada as well. But what we did was on a massive scale so that almost all of those DPs came through one of those centres and as I said, I mean some of these women were in those places for 15, 17 years and they lasted up into the 70s and they had kind of a really broad program of aims that changed over time and I think, you know, we see in the Australian context that um, they had no idea how big and complicated this was. So part of the problem was that, you know, there was nowhere, they, they were filling up, they hadn't built enough, they had to kind of keep expanding and building and finding more resources for them. That's very much an Australian story. The two year work contracts, um, also, I think that's that's a particularly Australian thing. I mean, I know in the US that um, you know people arrived and were basically left to their own devices, more or less. Probably had access to some services, but not in the kind of whole-scale, super organised um, way that they were in the Australian context. And they weren't necessarily allocated to work. I mean, I think that you know the work contracts were. Uh, very pragmatic and often quite cruel and um, there are some histories that Karen's been uncovering about um, some of the very remote work camps that men went to where there were really high rates of suicide um, and you know often men who had families who just never saw them after they went off to these places um, and you know thinking about Polish refugees I mean a lot of them were extremely highly educated and actually more highly educated than the average Polish person who hadn't come, who hadn't um, sought, you know, refuge, but their qualifications were 
totally irrelevant. Um, so I think Australia had very much its own needs in mind when it, when it um, started this massive complex program, but it also understood that in order for it to be successful, certain things had to work for the people that were coming here. They had to be safe, they had to have somewhere to stay, they had to be well fed. You know, there was a lot of kind of very hyperbolic positive um, stuff that was written and said about those places when in the early years, as places where people could go and be nourished and rest and be safe. And of course, some people experienced it like that, but it was very alienating for a lot of people too. Mm. Thanks, Kath and Vicky. We just have one uh, time for one last question from Maria, and and maybe one more. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you both. That was marvellous. Um, it was great, Kath, to see the picture of um, Maribyrnong Camp, where um, my own family migrated 15 years later in 1980, and um, from Poland, and also that that. Um, it actually, in 1980, was did have this feeling of refuge, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was a, a, a place that I have anyway positive memories of. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is for you, um, uh, uh, Nick, and that is, I'm just curious with um, Lydia Grablitska, in your own research, what did you find in the sense of Lydia's own connection to her to Poland as her homeland? Did she maintain it and how did she maintain it? And on the flip side, what is your sense of her establishment of herself in Adelaide and mm. Australia and her sense of belonging? How did she find that mm. here? Um, so I understand that um, sh as later in life she did visit Poland regularly to spend time with her family um, through reading uh, maybe Di Longley's work or Adam Dukowitz's work um, and in fact so, so a lot of her prints were um, based on memory, imagination, but also drawings that she made in um, Poland when she was studying at the academy, but also on subsequent visits. Um, in terms of her life in Adelaide, my understanding, there's, there's really not much kind of, not too much information documented about Lydia, so I'm kind of grasping at straws. But my general feeling was that she kind of, um, kept to herself. She didn't really um, put herself out into the art world. That's kind of my educated guess from the reading that I've done. She did find um, some sort of success um, with Rachel Biven, who was a gallerist, I think based in Adelaide. And then eventually she started to become collected um, by the Flinders University Art Museum, the Art Gallery of South Australia, the, um, the uh, South Australian Royal Society of the Arts and the NGA, the National Gallery of Australia, by um, Roger Butler. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> we had one last question here. Oh, okay, good, fantastic. So um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a great attendance. Thanks so much, Kath, for your really insightful and revelatory um, talk um, and sharing your recent research with us. I just also wanted to give one last plug um, just about this fantastic publication, Speak to Me, which was the brainchild of the Art Museum director, Fiona Salmon. If anyone is interested in this sort of cross-disciplinary research between art and other areas, I urge you to um, maybe have a look at this publication. If you're interested in purchasing it, it, it is available in our shop in the City Gallery in, on North Terrace in the State Library building. Um, so please, everyone, thank you again and another um, round of applause for Kat.